Maybe next time I'll get it without that. Okay. So, uh, great job. Uh, please uh, have questions, but save them to the end. We will take them all uh, after all the speakers are done, including from uh, the webcast audience. Our next presenter is Professor Lawrence Steinberg from Temple University. Hi. Um, thanks very much. Uh, when um, the planning committee decided to put together this initial panel, um, and I was told that I was given 15 minutes to talk about um, psychological development in young adulthood, it, it struck me as, um, as kind of a, a bad news, worse news situation because, you know, the bad news is that there's only 15 minutes and the worst news is that I'm not even going to need 15 minutes to tell you what we know. Um, the, um, you know, for the most part, I think we've made um, much greater strides um, in the disciplines of um, uh, uh, neuroscience, which Bea discussed, um, and sociology, which Rick is going to discuss, um, than we have in developmental psychology. Um, we know almost nothing at all about normative psychological development during um, this stage of life. We know um, a little bit about uh, individual differences uh, within this age period, and I'll talk a little bit about that. But in terms of charting out a, a normative progression of psychological, social, emotional development, um, there's, there's very little to say, actually. Um, so I want to just put out some broad principles here. I think that the, the, one of the central um, interests among developmental psychologists um, has really been, actually in my view, a very trivial question, um, which is whether this period is best thought of as an extension of adolescence, um, the first part of adulthood, or a unique stage called emerging adulthood, or whatever one wants to call it. I find this question utterly uninteresting, um, and I think it has no practical implications um, whatsoever. And I think we need to kind of get beyond um, that as the focus of our, um, of our research. Um, the, the a second point I want to make is that um, it's really important not to conflate a sociological observation uh, with a psychological theory. Um, for most of what's said about emerging adulthood really is a sociological observation um, about uh, some of the um, uh, some of the data that, that uh, were presented first today about changes in the age of marriage, changes in the age at which people um, move out of their parents' home, changes in the length of time people spend in schooling. And while all those things are true, um, it's simply an observation that one can glean from the census data. It doesn't really tell us anything at all about psychological development. And I think a fundamental question that we don't know the answer to, really, is whether these changes in the normative timetable of moving into um, the, the roles of adulthood are affecting the psychological development of people in this uh, age period, or whether um, there's something special about psychological development in the current generation of people in this age period that's affecting the timetable, right? And so one, one version of the story is that, um, you know, the, for, for economic reasons, um, there have been, there's been a slowdown in how, in, in how people progress from the roles of adolescence into the roles of adulthood, and that that has done something stunting, perhaps, um, to the psychological development um, of, those, um, of those individuals. That is, the underlying premise there is that in order to develop normatively during this time period, you need to be in the labor force, or you need to be in a committed relationship, or you need to not be living you know, in your um, a boy or girlhood bedroom. Uh, and that if you don't do those things, something will happen to your social and emotional development. But the flip, I, I think, side of that story is that um, for reasons that have to do uh, with what happened to those individuals earlier in development, how they were raised, for example, as children or adolescents, they became stunted and it was that stunting that made them not pursue entrance into these roles along a conventional timetable. And that's the kind of, kind of the lazy millennial um, stereotype. Um, and I don't think we know if either of those things is true whatsoever. Let me show you just very, th these are data that we just analyzed. Um, and so they're not published um, anywhere, and I, they, they are re really sort of the first pass of a project that we're going to be working on for a while. Um, data made available by John um, and his colleagues um, on the Monitoring the Future project. So 
Um, these are cohorts. Each of those vertical bars um, represents a, a, a cohort uh, that's defined by their age of high school graduation. Um, and so these are, this is the percentage of people at a given age in a given cohort who, who were economically dependent on their parents. This is that they took some money from their parents. So what you see here um, is that, let's just focus here, um, a huge increase in the percentage of individuals over time in these cohorts who are taking money um, from their parents. And as any parents in the audience, uh, I think, can attest, this probably rings um, very, very true. Um, it is not so true in, at age 19, because even back um, in this earlier cohort here, um, a lot of individuals were still going to post-secondary education, and therefore they were still economically dependent on their parents. So you see the bigger changes um, in, the, in the later uh, ages, okay? Um, this is for males. Um, if you look at data for females, you see pretty much the same pattern. That is, um, not very much historical change over time um, for the 19-year-olds, um, but very substantial change for the 23-year-olds, 25-year-olds, and 27-year-olds, right? Now, one might speculate that given this dramatic sociological change, and if I were to show you graphs um, uh, illustrating the proportion of people that were still in college, the proportion of people that were not married, um, and so forth, you'd see the same picture. I'm just choosing this one because this is one of those things that gets this, this variable, whether you're still dependent on mom and dad, is one of these variables that, get, that gets caught up in these emotional discussions about whether mom and dad have made you dependent or whether something about you is making you dependent on them. So you would think that there'd be tremendous some psychological changes in people as a function of this over time. And so if you look at data on, um, on attitudes towards self, um, what you see is that there really is very little change. We're talking here about a change on a scale, you know, from like 0.43 to 0.44. This is very, very, very small. And if you look here at the older age periods, there hasn't been any change at all. So I think we need to resist jumping to the conclusion that just because the demography of young adulthood has changed, that the psychology of young adulthood has changed. And, and this is just one variable, but we're, we've looked at some other variables and we don't see a great deal of change to, you know, in, in this data set. In other words, I'm not persuaded that today's 25-year-olds are any different psychologically than, the, than their parents were when they were 25, even though their life circumstances may be very, very different. Um, and we see the same thing, even actually a little bit more striking for females. We don't quite understand what's going on here. Um, that seems strange, but I, but I think that the the general pattern is that people are pretty much the same on this dimension now as they were in their parents' um, generations. Um, this has been said several times today, and I'm sure it's going to be said several times more. Um, you know, one of the things about the adolescent period is that although there are variations across um, uh, individuals and the resources that their families have, um, which affect how they live. For the most part, the experience of adolescence is structured very, very similarly among people from different uh, socioeconomic and ethnic groups. And it's structured pretty similarly around the industrialized world. That is what we expect people to be doing when they're between the ages of 10 and 18 isn't all that different, you know, in Texas than it is in Ohio, and it's not that different in the United States uh, than it is in, in France. But once you get to age 18 and beyond, you have all these different pathways that people um, can go on to in terms of further education, uh, in terms of whether they're living with their parents or not. So for rates are high here, but they're you know, off the charts if you look at Italian samples where it's always been much more normative for young adults to live uh, with their parents. Um, in terms of marriage, um, and uh, some of the work that Wayne Osgood and his group did as part of the Frank Furstenberg's network on um, transition to adulthood that was funded by MacArthur showed that there are many, many different pathways that people travel between uh, uh, 18 and, and, and 30. And so it's going to be, I think, more difficult to come up with a general theory of psychological development during young adulthood uh, that's going to apply across the population than it is 
uh, to come up with a theory about psychological development during adolescence, where people's experiences, although not identical, are much more likely to have things in common. So what do we know about uh, psychological development during this period of time? And, and I, and I want to emphasize two points that build on Bea's uh, presentation about the brain. Um, one thing is that there are continued increases in, in executive function, um, and impulse control, planning, and those kinds of, of aspects of psychological functioning. So that, the aspects of that portion of psychological development are still continuing to mature in young adulthood. These are data from one of our projects um, that come from a task in which individuals, it's a planning task, um, and it, uh, there were some easy problems on this task that, for those of you familiar with the literature, this is a, a task called the Tower of London. Um, for those, so that there were some easy problems on this task, which didn't take a lot of planning, um, and there were some hard problems, which took a great deal of planning. And we measured how much time people took before making their first move. Because if you make your first move and it's wrong, you're going to have to undo it, and you're not going to be able to solve the problems very efficiently. And so what you see here, what's important is that the green bars to represent time before first move on the hard problems, that there is still um, continued growth. And, and this really is taken in the literature as a measure of planning and thinking ahead um, that, that is going on um, as people move um, through their young adult years. So that the point I, the, I simply want to make here is that the maturation of impulse control or executive function and the psychological reflections of that is not complete by age 18 um, by any means. Um, a second thing uh, that we know is that there is this decrease in reward sensitivity. Um, that was a reflected in Bea's uh, uh, diagram showing you this inverted U-shaped curve of dopaminergic activity, of activity involving dopamine. And so people become less sensitive to, uh, to, to rewards um, as they move from adolescence um, into adulthood. And here are some data from another um, study within that sample where we had, using the Iowa gambling task, we constructed measures of sensitivity to reward and sensitivity to cost. And what you see here is that sensitivity to reward increases. This looks exactly like the dopamine curve that Bayer presented before. That sensitivity to reward increases. It peaks somehow here uh, in, in, in mid to late adolescence, and then it, it, it generally declines. Um, now. Um, what, we, what we also know is that um, there is a decrease in risk-taking during this period of time. Um, I'll just show you very quickly some of them. This is um, uh, FBI data on violent crime peaking around 18 or 19 and then declining steadily during the young adulthood years. Um, automobile crashes um, are higher among younger drivers and then they decrease steadily during the young adulthood years. Um, unintentional drownings. Uh, surprisingly enough, also peak around 18 or 19 uh, years of age, and they decline during the young adulthood years. Um, Non-fatal self-inflicted injuries decline during the young adulthood years. Um, the age of onset of illicit drug abuse or dependence declines during the young adulthood years. So we, we, a lot of us who, who have been working on the integration of brain and behavioral science here believe that this decline is related to that combination of improvements in impulse control um, and a diminishment in reward sensitivity, which then in, in turn leads people to behave in ways that, that don't engage in sensation seeking quite um, as much. Unintended pregnancies um, is another one that declines during the young um, adulthood years. So that, that I think there's two lessons in these data, that yes, the curve has hit its peak and it's declining, but it's still high relative to you know, the late 20s and early 30s. It doesn't mean that people are out of the woods at that point. That just means they're probably over the hump. Um, but we do know that it is a time, and this was mentioned before, of incredible vulnerability to psychiatric disorders. Surprisingly so, I think. But if you, um, if you are, just lay out the, um, the, the, the typical age range of onset, first appearance, of things like um, substance abuse disorders, anxiety disorders, mood disorders, schizophrenia, what you see there is what those have in common is this period between um, you know, 15 and 20. 
um, which is the most vulnerable time for serious psychiatric disturbance um, in the lifespan. So I think we need to think about the needs of young, um, of, of, of this population in terms of mental health services as well. There are very few serious psychological disorders that do not have young adulthood as part of their range of the common age of onset. I mean, other than autism spectrum disorder um, and ADHD, which by definition has to onset in, in um, middle or early childhood to be defined that way, virtually everything else, uh, you know, it, th this, this, is the, this is the period of heightened vulnerability. So let me just uh, um, uh, uh, conclude by talking about how I think the psychological agenda, as I said, there's no literature to review. So what I want to suggest is what we might, what we might want to work on. Right? I think that the old psychological agenda um, was, w had us focus on the development of identity and the development of intimacy. Those were the two tasks that were seen as what was supposed to be accomplished during um, early adulthood. Um, but I think that the changes in role demands have, made, have pushed these tasks into a later period of time. These tasks were thought of as the defining psychological tasks of young adulthood, when people entered career-related employment in their early 20s and when people started getting married in their early 20s. And that's why you needed to develop a sense of identity and develop a sense of mature intimacy. Now that those role transitions are happening much later, these may not be the relevant issues to be studying at this time period. And it seems to me that given what we know, um, given the requirements for success in the labor force and the fact that marriage is being delayed so much longer, that it seems to me, and I, I think Bea would probably agree, that a lot of the focus of this period of time is the development of what we call self-regulation, self-regulatory uh, competence, and the ability to sort of function without floundering in a world in which, as Claire mentioned, there's lots of choices and lots of decisions that have to be made. And how do you stay on uh, a, a steady pathway um, in an environment of tremendous um, uncertainty. And then I know that, that, that Rick is going to talk about this, so I will let him have the final words on this, but given what we know about changes in resonance and economic dependence and so on, there's a lot to be learned about how people of this age renegotiate their relationships with, um, with, with their parents. So um, for people interested in this topic, I think there is a great deal to do, but I think we've got to get beyond some of these simplistic ideas um, that have dominated the discussion for a long time. So thank you.